We're not crazy, the system is. Tune in to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health, Wednesdays 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern Time on Pacifica Affiliate WXOJLP FM 103.3 Valley Free Radio. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project. Streaming live, podcasting, and archived at madnessradio.net. Thanks for joining us on Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. And today we have Ronald Bassman. Um, Ron is a psychiatric survivor and activist. His work is internationally known. He was diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic, chronic paranoid schizophrenia, and has gone on to become um, an activist and leader in the recovery movement. He is now a clinical psychologist in private practice, as well as a teacher in community mental health at um, Sage College in Albany. He's a graduate, um, a graduate level teacher there, and he's also done a lot of work uh, with self help groups and is on the board of the National Association for Rights Protection and Advocacy. Um, Ron has recently published a, a new book, which is getting really, really um, great reviews and tremendous response. It's called A Fight to Be a Psychologist Experience from Both Sides of the Locked Door. So thanks for joining us today on Madness Radio, Ron Bassman. I'm really glad to be here, Will. Good to hear from you. And you've been involved in the um, psychiatric survivor activism movement for um, many, many years now. Is that right? Well, it, it's been close to 15 years now. Um, actually, uh, during much of the time of my own recovery, I was really not aware of um, the psychiatric survivor movement or any of the self-help movements. Uh, what I tried to do was stay out of the hospital by studying psychology. I thought mistakenly that if I became a clinical psychologist, then I would uh, have a kind of uh, protective shield against being hospitalized again. So I took that direction. And unfortunately, for many years, the, um, the psychiatric survivor movement, the consumer survivor movement of self-help was just not known in the professional community. So I went all through my PhD program knowing nothing about it until later when I came out. Well, that's really, I think that's one of the most amazing things about your book and about you and your work generally is how you, you went from being just absolutely at kind of the bottom, chronic, backward, paranoid, schizophrenic, and then you were able to recover. You're now off medications, and now you yourself are a practicing clinical psychologist. It's just a very inspiring um, story and, and you know you're someone who is um, known in your work around the world and it's just great to have you on the show today. Um, Ron, tell us about the story and I really want to talk about the book which got published recently but tell us about the story of how you first started having struggles with madness and how you got into the, um, the system. Well, I think uh, I'm learning that my story is not that unusual. Um, just after the book was published, I, I've been getting emails and, and letters from people who have read it or have come across my website, and they tell similar stories. It's usually from a family member, a parent that says, my son, my daughter, this has happened to them. Are they going to be like this for the rest of their lives? And what I'm saying is, you know, we don't really start out dreaming or having any conception that we're going to be in a mental hospital um, I was an overly sensitive youngster, a child. Uh, I came from a loving family, and no family is perfect. But um, I had the um, what I call a curse and a blessing of being very sensitive. So my identity um, was fragile. I, I, I fit in in some ways, but I always felt kind of different. Um, I was able to make it through uh, the developmental tasks, the chores, going to school, going to work, but I was unhappy, very unhappy, and just didn't feel like I was like other people. Um, after I got my master's degree, I was just confused. I, I wasn't really sure what I was going to do. This is back in 1966, and I had just gotten my master's from Temple University, and I was very naive, very immature, overly sensitive, and unhappy. 
and I wasn't sure what I was going to do. It was uh, a time when the draft was picking up for the uh, and the Vietnam War was picking up, and uh, I thought that I would be drafted and sent to Vietnam. And during that summer, I was just struggling with who I was. And I decided in my mind to just do whatever I wanted, to not live the way I had been living, kind of insecure and and sensitive and, and fairly timidly. And I just started to open up to different feelings. Um, I'm not sure exactly how that process works. I, I think at a certain point, you just um, want something different to happen. You try something different. And uh, I just, uh, in my mind, I said, I'm not going to care anymore what anybody thinks about me. I'm going to be my own person. And this whole world opened up for me, but it opened up too fast. I was uh, trusting my sensitivity, my instincts, and um, it just expanded very quickly. And I got, um, I guess, you know, in the psychological terms, it would be grandiose. I thought I was larger than I was, and it just kept getting bigger and bigger in my worldview. And then I started to hallucinate. I started to see things. I started to feel like I could make things happen just by exercising my mind. What were some examples of, of what you were, were doing? I mean, were you... Um having a hard time with other people? Were you acting in strange ways or was this more of an internal process that was going on? Well, I was acting very differently with other people, with my family. And um, actually, I was feeling pretty uh, euphoric. If anything, I was in kind of um, sort of a hyper state. Everything was new and exciting. What was interesting in that process was I was noticing things about people that I had ignored before. You know, when you're a child, you see things that other people deny, Uh, especially if you're a sensitive child. You look at expressions and body language, and people will tell you as a child, no, no, that's not right, but you know that it is right. And after a while, you start believing that your immediate intuition is wrong and you start going with other people with what other people are telling you now during this period of time my sensitivity which was natural anyway increased so when i'd be talking with somebody i would be cutting through what they were saying and and it would it would be kind of alarming when you're talking with somebody and you're um foregoing the natural social amenities and you're just cutting through and saying, well, you're really like this. You're not like that. So it became, at first it was fun. Then it became annoying to people. And it was like, I I guess uh, it was sort of overly aggressive in my point of view, what I was telling people. Some people liked it and were amused by it. Uh, Some people weren't. And my family was alarmed because I, I was different. Also, At the time, since I was thinking I was going to get drafted into the Army, I was just working at a job where I was just a shape-up job where we were cleaning factories, and my family felt like I should get a um, job that reflected my education. So on a lot of levels, I was just being very different than they had perceived me to be before. Do you think that all the stresses that you were going through, the graduating for college, not really knowing what you were doing, um, facing the possibility of the draft, being at that really, really very significant moment in the transition to adulthood when you start to step out into the world. Do you think that that played a big role in your switch from kind of a sensitive, sort of a more closed inward person to this kind of grandiose phase or state that you were in? I think it was a significant factor. I think, um, there was a lack of structure for me at that time to go from the structure of school and knowing what your responsibilities were to the lack of structure and not knowing where you were going was, in one sense, it was stressful if I looked at it. But what I I actually did was to deny the stress and move in a different direction. So it was it was partly the stress, but it was partly an accumulation of living a life that wasn't true to my nature and um, 
being basically <laughs> unhappy with my identity and who I was. It's such an interesting question. I've talked to so many people who go who go through some kind of real stress or even trauma, and then there's like a denial process where they push down what they're mm-hmm. going through, and then they kind of flip to the other side, which is this really expanded euphoric, and then that gets called mania or gets called psychosis. It's really interesting. Let me follow up on what you were saying, uh, Will, because it's a really important point, and it's cogent to just the work that I'm doing now. Just before um, we're speaking, I just saw somebody in my private practice who was going through this experience, and we were talking about it. And I was saying, often what happens, and what happened to me, this is somebody that I had shared my experience with, and who had read my book, who was going through one of these kinds of things. Uh, I generally don't do personal sharing unless it's relevant to whatever the person is dealing with. But I was saying to him, and we were looking at the notion of feeling trapped, when you feel trapped, almost metaphorically, um, you go through, you look for a door out of that trap, and if the doors that you always used, you know, your abilities, like your, your ability to think through having a good intelligence doesn't work and you try another door, And there's no other doors there. You can keep on trying those same doors, or you can say, I'm going to carve out a new door. And often that doorway will provide a lot of energy for you. But it's it's a kind of energy that you don't know how to use. And I I like to think in other traditions of healing and um, what usually is done is when somebody is developing that initiation into a tribe or adulthood, they usually have some mentoring or some guidance or some ritual. And when you do it yourself, you're kind of out there floating and uh, you can get in trouble. Absolutely. And I think that this is a pattern that a lot of people um, go through. There's a relationship between, like you were saying, people who are traumatized, there's a you feel trapped, and then suddenly some other resource emerges. People develop spiritual resources or they tap into this huge energy and i know it's called kundalini in um, yogic tradition it can be referred to as a shamanic initiation process Mm -hmm. or or a crisis Um, and it sounds like there's something similar to that is what you're you're going through is that you were kind of blocked in where you were and then you just like you say carved out this whole new capacity but then it kind of started to be overwhelming or it was too much and then it's taken you time to really start to learn how to to relate to that and how to have it be more in balance with the with the rest of you. Tell me about how it was that you got from that sort of wild state into the hospital system. Was it really your parents that started to be concerned about you or Yeah. Yeah, it was definitely my my family and it, it's it's a very um <laughs> It, it's uh, reflective of my naivete and my innocence at that time. I had a master's degree in psychology, and I knew nothing. And I think a lot of people know nothing about what faces you when you defy norms of your family or society, even if you're not doing any harm to yourself or others. So their alarm uh, resulted in a lot of discussions until finally um, – I had the mistaken notion that the only way to get them off my back would be to go into the hospital and um, prove to them that I was sane, which is completely bizarre. (laughs) You don't go into a mental hospital to prove that you're sane because once you go in, it doesn't matter. It reminds me of the film One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest where Jack Nicholson, the reason that he goes into a psychiatric hospital is I think he's trying to avoid jail or he's got some other reason <laughs> yeah what what actually happened was my parents called a cousin who was a clinical psychologist and they asked for advice and he brought me to a psychiatrist he knew and um, that person did their 10-minute evaluation and suggested that they uh, bring me to a hospital immediately and then the story started I was really angry about the recommendation Uh, but I thought, you know, it would be easy enough. I would just talk to people down at the um, hospital, and the hospital was Newark, uh, that's Newark, New Jersey, Newark City Hospital, which was an inner-city hospital where um, 
basically they had a uh, one ward set up for just pretty much drunks, drug addicts, and uh, people who wandered around the streets. And I had no idea that I would be going uh, to be placed on that ward. I thought I would be just talking to somebody at the hospital. They'd say, hey, he's okay. You know, leave him alone. So what happened once you got there? Uh, my brother drove me down there, and I had a really good friend um, who came with us. And my friend Elliot, who was street smart, uh, kept trying to tell me, don't go, you know, just do something, you know, let us let me get you out of here. And I said, no, it'll be okay. We got to um, the emergency room, and I have to, my memory's a little spotty here because I got, um, you'll see why in a few minutes. But I got there, and they wouldn't let Elliot come along. They had my brother come with me and um, filled out some forms. Um, I believe it was two attendants took me um, upstairs, uh, I got into a hospital gown, and they put me in a bed in this dormitory kind of room. It was night, and there were probably about 15, 20 beds in the room, uh, just kind of cot-like beds, and then they wanted to tie me down. And I said, no, don't, don't tie me down. Uh, I was saying, they wanted uh, me to be laying on my back. I said, I can't sleep on my back. I, I I repeat this, and I always think how bizarre it was. I'm talking to them like they're going to listen to me. So they tied me down, um, not real strong restraints. It was just um, uh, over my chest and I think over my legs. And, you know, I kind of argued with them. They kind of laughed at me and walked out. And I said, you know, I was still feeling all my power. And I said, I'll just get out of these restraints easily enough if you don't take me out. And I did. And then I... um, foolishly announced that I could get out of the restraints any time I want. So um, then they came, held me down, put me in four-point restraints, and injected me with, I assume it was Thorazine or one of those medications. The next thing I knew, I um, woke up, lost a day or two, and woke up in a seclusion room naked in a um, hospital, mental hospital. Spent the next six months there. That is just that's just a horrifying um, image, and at no point were you dangerous or violent or no, suicidal or anything like that. So you were there for six months. Yeah. Did you end up going back into restraints and seclusion? Were you on medication the whole time, or how how was your stay in the hospital? Well, um, this is another part of it. Um, I was in the seclusion room for a while. I yelled a lot. Uh, let me out, you know, it's not fair, you can't do this to me, you know, I have rights, which I didn't have, but I wasn't aware of it. Um, you know, there's, there's a, I was watching a couple of weeks ago George Carlin do a skit on HBO, and he got into a long riff about rights. He said, you know, he was talking about how people in this country think they have rights, and he said, you don't have rights, you have privileges, and you learn that when your rights are taken away from you. Well, that's what I learned about 30 years ago, that uh, your rights are really privileges, especially if you're in a mental hospital. So I was in there until I stopped yelling, I uh, stopped being a horse. I was drugged up a lot, a lot of uh, injections. You know, at a certain point, if you yell too much, they just get tired of it, and they'll give you an injection. You go to sleep for a while. And time passed. Um, I don't have much memory of that. And then when I was left out to wander around the ward, I remember real clearly I thought I had won because I was still thinking the same thing every now and then. A psychiatrist would stop me and ask me if I still thought uh, I had ESP. And uh, the bizarre part about it was he'd usually have his uh, posse with him of you know some social workers, some nurses. He'd stop me in the hall and said, you have ESP, ha ha. Well, grow hair on my head if you have ESP. And, you know, I got tired of explaining to him that you know, it's not magical power to make the hair grow, but then he'd do his little skit and show that no new hair was grown. But anyway, I was doing that for a while, and since I, I still felt like I was holding on to my identity, they, um, they felt like the heavy doses of the medication wasn't working. And I was still 
rebellious, that's when they decided to give me electroshock and insulin coma therapy. So one of the one of the things that you were believing in this kind of grandiose expanded states was that you had psychic or paranormal ESP powers, and even though you were restrained and drugged and put in seclusion, and and they were really trying to to make you let go of that mm-hmm. belief, and you would not let go of it. They were ridiculing you, and you just you just hung on to it until they escalated to electroshock therapy. Yeah. Well, it was a combination, electroshock and insulin coma. I actually don't recollect the electroshock. I saw it in my records. Um, At the time, what they were doing is they'd put you in an insulin coma, and then they'd give you electroshock while you're in it. So it had the combined force. Well, this is one of the one of the really disturbing parts of the history of the psychiatric system. But can you tell us what an insulin coma is? Well, basically, it's an injection of enough insulin to put you into a coma. You know, I have um, a part in my book that describes it. It's just too awful. Uh, I've done a lot of thinking about that particular uh, treatment because it was so um, so influential in, in my life um, in terms of loss, loss of memory, and different kinds of things that I tried very hard to remember as much as I could the actual details and the feelings of it. If you would like, I, I, would, I could read a page of it which clearly um, tells you what insulin coma is. Each weekday morning before breakfast, we were herded into the gray, surreal basement of the hospital and directed to cot-like beds where we were injected with enough insulin to put us into comas. Accustomed as we were to the the groggy effects of our other medications and not fully awake, it just seemed as if we were going back to sleep. After we lost consciousness, our hands and feet were bound to prevent us from injuring ourselves. The purposeful destruction of our brain cells was far more acceptable than an accidental injury during the treatment. Fear would suddenly appear at the end of the coma treatment when I was awakened into a semi-conscious state. I felt empty, my body a hollow shell without nerve pathways, set adrift and apart from my mind. Panic. I can't move. Am I about to die? I can't completely open my eyes. I try to move. I cannot. A shadowy figure is near me saying something. I am unable to understand what he is saying. The words become louder. Swallow. Drink up. He holds my head up and presses a straw between my lips. Drink, he insists. I try. I must obey. With great effort, I manage to get some liquid in my mouth. A sweet wetness trickles down my throat. I gag. I can't breathe. Swallow it. Swallow is the incessant demand. I swallow, and I feel a bit more of my body coming to life. Keep drinking is the order. I try. Starting to rouse, I squirm in the sweat-soaked sheets and weakly tug at the restraints. I search for something familiar to ease the panic. Immobile, awake in a nightmare, I cannot grasp who I am. I am barely me. I must finish drinking the the sugar solution until the huge bottomless container is empty. I am drowning in the liquid I drink. It is as if I am being pulled from my grave while gagging on fluid that is being poured into me. The presence of death feels as real as the voice pressuring me to drink the glucose back into my bloodstream. I am tumbling into a vortex. I feel myself being pulled out by a stream of liquid. I hold on. I am bursting from the liquid, pouring and pouring and pouring down my throat. With absolute certainty, I know that if I don't do something, if I do not fight, I will die. But for which side do I fight? I do not know whether life is drinking and awakening or letting myself continue to fall to the bottom of the hole and ending this nightmare. I struggle to free myself from the straps around my ankles and wrists, but the only reward for my efforts are the bruises whose origins I would later try to remember. I fight with all my strength. My observers see no fierce battle, merely the easily managed thrashings of an unruly child. 
a lifetime of torturous indecision, wavering between the poles of cooperation and rebellion, passivity and assertion, acceptance and challenge, were comically diminished in those battles. The unalterable fact that I would only be untied when the, link, when the liquid in the container was completely drained. The war, the life or death decisions were only waged in my mind. The outcome had already been determined and always mocked me in the same way. That's insulin coma. I had that treatment for eight weeks, five days a week, 40 treatments. And this was considered considered a, a curative medical treatment. It's done on like hundreds of thousands. I mean, how many people was it done on? And I don't I don't think that it's still practiced anywhere in the world today. Is that, no, is that correct? No, no, it's it's a disowned treatment. I was one of the last groups to receive it. Um, it's not given any anymore any place. I um, often when I'm talking with um, ex-patients, survivors, if I'm at a hospital or a group, I'm always curious if there's anybody there who's had insulin coma treatment. At this point, over the years, I've only met three other people, Leonard Roy Frank, Dorothy Dundas, and um, Don Whites, who's up in Canada, who have all survived insulin coma treatment and have their, their minds intact. And interestingly enough, we, we have this this bond, the shared bond, and that we're all good friends at this point, and um, we're all active in trying to do things that uh, will prevent people from having treatments like this. You referred to it as torturous, and I, I think your description just makes it very clear that this is a form of torture, that you were confined, and these were punishments that were used against you in the name of, of medicine and treatment, but they were essentially to try and get you to change your beliefs, which is really the, the, the definition of, of torture, is the inflicting of uh, pain and physical harm to get someone to conform to a different set of, of beliefs. Yeah, yeah. So, Ron, I, so tell us about how you were able to get from this very, very dark place um, out, because thankfully you're here with us today and you're, you're a leader in the international movement to change these abuses and reform the, the system. How was it that you were able to turn, turn things around and get out of the hospital and, and start to, to heal and move on? I think I've uh, really been um, surrounded by a lot of opportunity by uh, the support of family, by friends. Um, there, there are so many different elements um, that contributed to me coming around. Um, it's why I've written them down because um, it's so different for each individual what it will be helpful, but there's common aspects, the relationships you have with people and the support you get is critical. Um, I feel like you have to have some sense of safety, some respite from the assault on your um, your mind and your soul, which too often um, traditional mental health or I should say mental illness practices um, inflict on people. What was it that was able to help you to get out of the hospital and what were some of the key kinds of support and help that you got? Well, one of the reasons I got out of the hospital the first time is my insurance ran out, um, so the treatment was ended. People who listen to the show know that that's actually part of my story, is that I was um, on the list for getting electroshock therapy and actually was released, even though I was considered a danger to myself and, and unable to take care of myself, I was released because the insurance ran out. So it's a common thing, but it, it would kind of saved both of us in a way. Well, yeah, and it, it's also, my family was very loving, and uh, my mother, who was, it was really a matriarchal family, uh, my mother believed what they were telling her at first, but then when she saw the condition I was in, it's, um, there was no denying for her eyes what, what I looked like after I had all these treatments. I had blown up with weight from all the sugar solutions. I there was no spontaneity. I had no memory. And, you know, at, at that point, she was just saying, give me my son back. <laughs> let me let me have him. 
but she still kind of bought into the notion that I would need treatment. Um, um, they told her I would have to be on medication for the rest of my life, that I would always need treatment. That you were a paranoid schizophrenic and you were chronic and this is a long-term thing for your whole life. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There'd be no cure. The One of the things that I had, uh, which was an advantage, was during the period of time this happened, there wasn't as strong a belief in the medications. It was easier for me to get off medications because, you know, even though people could see they were not working, they weren't doing anything, um, we see that now with people and still they, um, they have to stay on it. So once I started to get a little bit of energy back and, and uh, started to get some memory back and, and get more I guess, uh, my soul back. I wanted to get off the medication. I'll tell you a funny story. I was out with my old friend, Elliot, who was instrumental in my recovery because he stayed by me and stayed with me. I just wanted to stay home and do nothing. I was embarrassed in the condition I was in and who I was, and he would drag me out. And even though I wouldn't say anything, he'd just take me along. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, one... One night, this was, I guess, maybe about three months after I was out of the hospital, I, I had my Thorazine pills with me, the, the capsules. I think they were capsules at that time. And we were out uh, just hanging out. There were a couple of girls with us, me, Ellie, and a couple of girls at the time. And um, I remembered that I had to take my Thorazine, so I took the bottle out of my uh, my pocket and uh, I took one, and one of the girls, Issa, who was starting to experiment with drugs, this is like 1966 or 67, it was before you know drugs became as ubiquitous and everybody was doing it, and she was early on into stuff, and she said, what is that? And I said, well, it's you know a pill that I'm supposed to take, and she said, what does it do? And I said, well, I don't know. And I said, you know. She said, could I have one? I said, sure. You know, I gave it to her. A couple of days later, I ran into Issa, and she says to me, what was that that you gave me? She said, I slept for like 15 straight hours. I said, stories, and she said, throw that shit away. And that was the beginning of my, um, you know, it combined with other things, but I think about nine months later, I was finally able to get away from taking any kind of drugs. And I guess this is also why Thorazine never has had much of a street market as a recreational <laughs> no, drug. No, it's no, nothing no you're not going to hit anybody over the head to score Thorazine. Ron, read us some more of your, your book. You know what I'd like to read? Um, it's actually, it's from, the, it's from the book, but it's really on the inside cover. And it's a, a piece um, that kind of addresses this, not in full detail, but it's a short piece from the inside cover. And it goes like this. My ascent from madness to my present state of clarity and self-acceptance was and is a journey whose responsibility always resided within me. However, as I try to describe and share with others what wisdom I acquired to aid them in their own work, I acknowledge one element that I do not understand or take credit for, something that is named or interpreted according to one's unique beliefs and values as luck, fate, karma, or God's blessing. I believe that as long as a person is alive, some seed of hope, some possibility is there waiting to be fertilized. Hope fights the fear nurtures the courage and inspires the vision and the work required to resist giving up and accepting that your goals are unattainable. Deep in the recesses of our being, there are safe sanctuaries, secure hiding places for never fully lost dreams. But sometimes they are hidden so well that we can no longer reach those parts of ourselves. The help we need may come from expected or unexpected sources. And basically, what I'm, what I'm saying and, and to kind of address what you're asking is I think uh, most of us have a spark of spirit no matter how far down we're pushed. And when that, that spirit, that hope, that dream can 
be connected with that can be rekindled either through something that we do or that somebody helps us with. That's what starts us on the road back. Um, I don't know what kept it alive for me. I felt like at various times, and I still do, that the insulin shock and the electroshock took something away from me. Um, there's a piece that I, I feel is somewhat missing, an intuition or something. I can't really grab onto it. But I don't know why it didn't take everything from me, and I think it has from people. Um, you know, there are many instances where insulin actually killed people, the comas, they weren't regulated. But they, they also, it destroys brain cells. So what kept this spark alive for me for me is um, something that was internal, perhaps, some some luck, some karma. And what kindled it was the supports that I got from various places, um, my struggle to engage in various ways of building myself up. Uh, I studied many of the Eastern traditions. I tried different kinds of meditations. I... I felt like one of the most important things was the ability to exercise self-discipline, the development of the will, the learning that if you can really work at and practice something, you can develop it. Um, so there were many factors that went in, um, and I had a lot of outside help from people. When did you start to become an activist and to speak out and organize um, against the abuses of the system and start working for, for change? You know, as soon as I got out of college, even when I was in my doctoral program, I knew that I would uh, not practice the way other people practiced. Uh, but back then, I had to keep uh, my background hidden. I would have never gotten into school, and I would have never gotten licensed. Uh, now it's a bit easier, but it's still hard. Um, when people call me and ask if they should come out about their background when they're in graduate programs, I, I typically, unless it's relevant to them as an individual recommend that they wait until they get licensed and established a little bit. Um, so I knew that I would be practicing differently. And before I actually came out and revealed to people my background, I started to work with um, the Mental Health Association actually as an advocacy group. And that was before the Mental Health Association got so embedded with the drug companies and started to provide services. Uh, this was back at a time where they did, especially where I was, mostly advocacy work, and I worked with them. I eventually became president of the board of the Mental Health Association in the particular county I worked in. actually met my wife, who was a board member there. Um, and uh, I still was, except for a few people um, that knew me, I, I didn't reveal it to patients. I didn't reveal it to other people. But I, I had this notion that I had to. It was something I was driven to make use of my experience. And that's when I started writing, actually, 25 years ago. I wanted to talk about it. I wanted to reveal it. But I also wanted to understand it before I was able to do anything about it. So I wound up probably for about 10 years just practicing and, and being in the closet. And then I was... Um, I decided I needed to change where we needed to change as a family. And I took on a job as the executive director of a mental health center in South Dakota, uh, which is another long story. But while I was out in South Dakota, I met Ray Unziger uh, just by chance at a meeting. And she uh, mentored me. She also, that was the first person I knew who was a psychiatric survivor and also was part of a movement. But more importantly, it was the first person I connected with who um, had an experience like mine and was really active and functioning and clear, and uh, we bonded immediately. It was like, my God, I, I couldn't believe I found somebody else, and then I started to meet other people. It was uh, it was such an uplifting experience, and uh, for anybody who knew Ray. I mean, she was like an anti-Mame character, and I remember the first time I met her, and, I, uh, and she invited me over to her home, 
and uh, I told her who I was and, and what my experience was, and she grabbed me and gave me a big hug, and I just cried. And that's how I got into it. Ron, I want to go back to something that you mentioned before about how um, kind of the beginning of um, of this story when you got into the system, you were having this very expanded and grandiose kind of energy that you you accessed, and then it was kind of squashed down by... Um, the experiences that you had in the hospital. I'm wondering, are you, do you still experience that side yes. of yourself? Can you tell us yes. about that? And what, yeah. have you, what have you learned about that? Because I'm really, I'm very intrigued by what you're going through as a spiritual awakening process yeah. and the energy qualities of it. And it's so similar to what so many people go through. And then you've come out the other end as a healer and a teacher and, and, and really someone who has a, a lot to offer back to the, to the community. It really transformed you and initiated something for you. And so can you tell us about how you are working with that kind of energy today and what you learned about it? I can tap into it at this point. Um, some of it I can't. Uh, there's almost like a governor on me. And I don't know if it was the insulin shock or it's just my own um, compromise that I won't take it to where it can go. I just don't know. And I'm intrigued by it. And sometimes I think geez, I've been cheated out of this. Um, but I can let myself just merge with with what's around me and my consciousness. I can, you know, typically what that described that in psychological terms is often getting paranoid, that you get a heightened sensitivity, that you, you can feel things. Uh, so if we... I can get in touch with that when I'm working with people. I don't do it very often, but I can feel myself entering their consciousness and just connecting with if they're, um, you know, experience this heightened state, I can just kind of move into it and feel it. Uh, I'm very judicious about allowing myself to do that either with people or in other contexts. Um, but yes, it, it's there. Um, I kind of, um, I like it actually. And, um, it's just, you know, something that's there. That's part of me. Sometimes it's not good, but most of the time it is. So in your work with clients, um, tell us some of the things that you do differently with people, someone who's maybe coming in, who's very suicidal or very, very distressed or having a hard time taking care of themselves, or maybe someone who's struggling with some of the same kinds of energy and grandiose expansion that you were struggling with. What kinds of, of support and advice and guidance do you, do you give, do you give them? Well, you know, unfortunately many of the people I see at this point in time are not coming in, you know, innocent or clean. Often they've been bounced around and they're on drugs already. Um, it's very typical for somebody to have almost any kind of thing that's troubling them in their life, a breakup with a girlfriend, a loss, and they're put on an SSRI, a Paxil, or well, the current one now that everybody's put on is Lexapro. And then they'll be given a benzodiazepine, either Clonopin or Xanax, to control their anxiety until the SSRI is supposed to kick in. So I'll see people... Um, when they're already on something. And then I have to make a distinction of what they want. If they're saying they don't want to be on it, I'll work with them. So the primary thing that I try to do is to join with a person in terms of whatever their goals are, to try and understand what they want and try to help them move to it, to reconstruct whatever is going on in a way that meets their goals best. So really the first part of it is really being as sensitive as I can to what they're going through. The other part that is extremely important is I have to communicate to them in some way that they're safe with me, that I'm not going to do something that they don't want or that they can share stuff with me without being afraid. And that takes time. Uh, you know, some people are more trusting than others. So... In terms of using my experience, I guess the, the main part of it would be that I don't believe anybody has a formulaic way of getting 
out of their discomfort or getting to the place they want is kind of joining with them in a journey or in a search and trying to understand and also having them take the leadership that they know themselves better than I ever could. And I just, I try and look at each person as if I know nothing and I really don't. You know, each person is an adventure. It's a mystery. I don't know what I'm going to do. Early on in my practice, I felt I was really a bad therapist because everybody else said, well, you do this, you do that. And I said, I don't know what I'm going to do, you know, it, based on what's happening. And I always value the aspect of nothing's going to happen unless the person has complete choice over what goes on. So those are pretty much the central themes of the way that I work. Can you read another section from your book for us? Sure. Uh, this is a piece that I, I like um, because it reflects partly of what I think in my work and how I feel. Quote, I have met and had the opportunity to share with and learn from extraordinary individuals of great courage, psychiatric survivors who are working to make positive changes so that those who come after them will experience less pain and abuse. I have also had the privilege of meeting some remarkable mental health professionals whose integrity and pursuit of truth make them outsiders relegated to working at the margins of their disciplines. Forging deep friendships with my peers, I have found community in our shared experience and our passion for helping fellow travelers. We helped ourselves find meaning when we helped others. Is it any wonder that the people who do recover are the very ones who have rejected the mental health enforcers' pronouncements and carved their own way into a new life? The people that I know who have transformed their experience are easily recognized by their passion, vitality, and appreciation of life. They are winners by virtue of having engaged in the process of peering deep inside and not being destroyed by what they encountered. Victors in the fight to find meaning and identity, they are reminiscent of people who have survived near-death experiences. Their understanding and identity changes. When you allow yourself to descend into the depths of an altered state, the need for safety moves from foreground to background. When you pass death's threshold as described in your death experiences, safety's demands are radically modified. I believe that we actively make a decision to let go when we enter a different realm of consciousness. In time-tested mystical traditions, one's decision is reinforced by a commitment to rigorous preparation. Most of us do not have the determination, clarity of vision, or access to that special guide who is right for us. Instead, we accommodate to our fears and life demands. But for those who must deal with too much fear, who cannot navigate the limited number of paths presented to them, who lack the skills, self-esteem, societally approved competencies, who have been hurt repeatedly, who feel the constant pain of extreme sensitivity, who have not learned how to trust or love or have never been loved in a way that matched their needs, who see no future and abhor themselves and hate their life story. When critical mass is reached, there is a choice to forgo safety and risk all. The mental health system is not a facilitator of growth and change if it cannot permit a person to risk his life in an attempt to create a future which is not a continuation of his predictable and horrific past. The book is called A Fight to Be, A Psychologist Experience from Both Sides of the Locked Door. Ron, how is the, and we don't have very much time, but tell us a little bit about how the book is being received and um, how people can get a copy and also get in touch. Well, the the best way to get in touch with me is to, to go to the website that I have, um, and it's www.ronald, R-O-N-A-L-D-B-A-S-S-M-A-N, my name. If you forget that, just do a Google search. It's... <laughs> 
I'm more on the internet than I think I should be, but it's pretty easy to find me. It's been it's been great. You know, I'm kind of waiting. You know, some friends of mine just published a book and they got reviewed in the New York Times and were raked. I don't get. I haven't been um, criticized. Every uh, you know, it's surprising. I've had you know such a warm reception from both professionals, psychologists, and and from family members and from different people. It's uh, it it's just it, it's startling to me uh and i'm just kind of waiting for the you know for the critique and i'll probably hate it but you know it's a self-published book so it the reviews are limited i can't get in the newspaper reviews but i've been reviewed um by a couple of journals and different people in different places and I, i've been extremely pleased i i, I couldn't have predicted or or wanted much better uh, and most satisfying is really I've been getting a lot of emails from people saying that, um, you know, they really uh, feel more hope and inspiration and um, and they're giving it to somebody to read. I've had people buy several copies to give to friends. It's um, it's just it's very rewarding. Um, <laughs> it's funny. I, I'm. You know, my task in life right now is to diminish as much ego as possible. So I'm always kind of on the alert not to get a swelled head. And I don't think I, I am, but it's very nice to get compliments anyway. Well, it's an amazing story, and you're a very inspiring person. It's great to have you on the show today. And, and congratulations uh, on the book. So thanks a lot for joining us today, um, Ron Bassman. Thanks, Will. You've been listening to an interview with Ronald Bassman. Um, Ron is the author of A Fight to Be, a psychologist's experience from both sides of the locked door. And you can find out more information by going to his website, which is ronaldbassman.com. That's about all the time we have this week on Madness Radio. Thanks a lot for joining us, and we'll see you next week. been listening to madness radio voices and visions from outside mental health madness radio is broadcast every wednesday 6 to 7 p.m eastern standard time on pacifica affiliate wxojlp fm 103.3 valley free radio in northampton massachusetts for our live internet stream podcasting show archives and more visit madnessradio.net madness radio is co-produced by freedom center and the icarus project for more information, check out freedom-center.org and theicarusproject.net. For more mental health radio, listen to the news hour from mindfreedom.org, Wednesdays, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio, or you just want to share what's in your head, contact us at radio at madnessradio.net. KWMD, Kasilov, 90.7, Anchorage, 104.5.